So hello, everybody. This is the Enigma podcast for this week. With me is Mr. Raj Java. Hi, Raj. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Raj Jawa. I am an uh, actor, producer. Uh, I do all kinds of things, really, uh, streamer. Uh, but yeah, my my mains are acting and producing. In uh, 2020-ish, uh, I, I started using my YouTube channel for uh, streaming. So I started streaming a lot of indie video games, whatever I could get my hands on, basically. Um, I used, like, Lurk It and a few of those other uh, websites to... Um, connect with indie developers to like get a key to to try out their game and showcase it on the YouTube channel. So that's really what I've been doing on YouTube lately. Most likely, I'll probably pivot back into um, sketch work soon. I, I was doing sketch work, and obviously, I had my actor reels on YouTube, and those are still all up there. Um, but if you look at my YouTube today, it looks like I'm basically just a gamer guy, uh, which is fair. Like I am a gamer, but uh, but. I am trying to figure out the best way to um, kind of mix those two, like like bring some of the gamer maybe sketches, but also uh, push my acting career. Because I do feel in some ways the, uh, as much as I thought like, oh, being a gamer and an actor, that's such a unique whatever um, twist on the, on the space. Um, it didn't really turn out that way. And I think being a gamer, trying to gain a gaming audience is particularly um, challenging. So I'm, I'm kind of pivoting back to like, you know, showcasing more acting stuff again, not that I dislike gaming or anything has changed on my gaming attitude, but, uh, yeah, just trying to see where, you know, on the business end of things, just trying to see where the best trajectory for me is to, you know, not, uh, to ideally get, um, to get acting work regularly. And his first film, which we'll talk about later in this podcast, The Seductress from Hell. Can you share your two bits about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, The Seductress is a is a, is a movie I I, uh, I produced with a uh, very talented and uh, very uh, visionary uh, actor. Uh, sorry, uh, director writer uh, named Andrew DeBerg. And uh, yeah, we we connected a while back. Um, he worked on a commercial for, uh, you know, my family's business, Indie Sweets and Spices, um, and we wanted to work together on something a little more robust. So, uh, yeah, he came to me with the script, and I said, yeah, this sounds great. Seems like a great critique on, uh, on like, capitalism, which is something I am very interested in. And, uh, yeah, we, we just kind of went from there. Sounds fantastic. We'll talk about this more. I'll ask you more questions later on. At this point, I would like to discuss some new horror films with you. One of the most popular topics right now is the Terrify of Free film, which is being released pretty soon and uh, for which the first reactions are already out. What are your thoughts on the Terrifier series? I have not seen any of them, but I will say I um, either must have been through marketing uh, or, or whatever of the film. I'm mm -hmm. definitely very familiar with Art the Clown character. He's become a iconic um symbol when like if if someone compiles a a trailer of horror movies or mm -hmm. other things you often see his character so i am familiar i've definitely seen and been aware of the terrifier terrifier franchise but i've actually never seen it i've actually never seen a, a single one of the movies and i mean i don't think it's my like i'm not a big gore um type of horror fan but i will say i am impressed by the um, successful franchising of such a movie. Like, like, I think that's the goal of any, um, any, like, uh, anyone who wants to continually work in horror is aiming for making an iconic character that, that really stands out and stands the test of time, ideally. And that looks like what's happening with the Terrifier franchise to me. Yes, and uh, it's. Um, I think what's really amazing about this franchise is like they made the first film literally out of peanuts. Like the initial investment was like I don't know, it was it was literally like nothing in comparison to like commercial Hollywood films that are out by prominent studios like Blumhouse and whatnot. But that film ended up making a lot of money, and then there was a sequel that followed. And it's 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 like I know for some people, gore is not something that they're a fan of, but for whatever reason, it's bringing back all the elements of the classic American slashers of the 80s and the late 70s and so on. 
just to cover this aspect, I've seen like Terrifier 3, because we've been talking about this for a while. The reviews, the first reactions are out. It's been getting really exciting and really encouraging responses from the first time viewers. Definitely. Definitely. I see that in the in the article you sent over for this interview. Absolutely. It's uh yeah. It's definitely um, the 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 uh, the tweets the the reviews are definitely very boisterous, very um, very uh, you know. There's definitely a lot. Clearly, it surprised a lot of people. I think from the reactions um, to be so, um, uh, I guess to push the genre even further. From the looks of it, people are saying it's even gorier than its predecessors, and the the other films by themselves are like so gory from today's standards the gore in the previous films and in my opinion the terrifies 2 was like probably like the goriest film that's been released in the recent times so, how, wow. so i'm just thinking like how can you top something like that absolutely i'm trying to think of the the goriest thing i've seen i i, I tend not to like i said but uh sometimes <laughs> it, it's in movies that you don't expect like they're not horror movies i think one of them was uh that sticks out to me uh, it was a uh, Titan uh, when the main character is not a horror film. I don't, not, to my knowledge, maybe, a, maybe a little bit of body or like, um, I don't know. It's a weird, weird horror if, if anything, but, uh, but she smashes somebody's head in with a stool. Uh, and that's really, that's, that's a lot that, that for me is already too much. Um, so yeah, I, when I think of gore, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely something I, I definitely, uh, shy away from generally. Oh, you're going to love Terrifier too then. And from the looks of oh, Terrifier 3 too. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I look forward to, I look forward cause I, I have to check it out, especially now that it is so iconic. I have to at least check out the first one. Yeah. Uh, but maybe jumping into the third one is, is the way to go. You never know. Yeah. No. I mean, if I tell you they really stretched the bar with this one, it's like, in the most literal sense ever, because they really like went to places that most modern films don't. Yeah. Can you expand a bit on what you mean by that? Like going for uh, no, because in the what first, said, in the second further? film, no spoilers to anybody. In the second film, there's a really dramatic scene where, um, the um, it's it's basically there's a skinning, uh, a woman ah. is skinned basically to like bare bones. Yeah. It's like you know, yeah, that's pretty extreme. To our next topic, the substance trailer starring Demi Moore and uh, Margaret Quarry. Is that how you pronounce her name? You know, I never, th- I never thought of. I think I, I thought it was Quail, but I probably don't have it correct. I mean, I thought, it, I thought the trailer was great. Um, I, I think it looks like it's going to be a, a really good movie. I think I'll really like it. Um, from what I saw in terms of like the social commentary that's happening, I think my, uh biggest issue with uh movies like this is uh, like i love them i love the i love the um uh, the commentary on on social issues and things like that this this being like beauty standards and the expectations <laughs> of of maintaining them um i think m- my greatest issue i have with with movies like this mm-hmm. is is unfortunately is unfortunately the the audience never quite takes away uh anything seemingly this is this is my this is maybe a little too um little too social commentary ish from my end but like i you know i i i make movies and i like watching movies for the sense of maybe it's catharsis of like oh this movie actually sees the issue it understands the issue it's trying to get a message out um, and I think the unfortunate reality we live in is the message only goes to, you know, the intellectual critic, the, the someone writing a think piece about the movie. But I think unfortunately for the mainstream audiences, most people that watch movies, it's kind of going over their head. It's, it's, it's a, I think, uh, you think to, to put a phrase on it, I think it's a lack of media literacy. <laughs> but uh but yeah the, mm. that's the problem i have with like i love these movies i wish every movie had social commentary and and was uh you know trying to affect change and yet the reality we live in is audiences like you know may like the movie and may like oh yeah that's a good thing but never like get like oh that's a good point i should stop you know idolizing beauty i should stop you know these these ideas um you know it, it's very 
it becomes very maddening on my end to like see these movies, see movies try to have messages, social commentary, political commentary, whatever the case may be. And kind of the audience doesn't quite uh, see it. I mean, Seductress is, is similar and I'm, I'm, you know, equally worried that audiences won't uh, take, take a message from it. But yeah, that's, that was my whole thought watching the substance. I'm like, Oh, I love this. This is great. You know, uh, you know, Demi Moore has to, uh, is, is aging out. It's, it's everything we talk about when we talk about issues in Hollywood and yet it's not going to change anything. I liked trailer. I mean, uh, it was fun from what I saw and, um, yeah. I liked the cinematography. The technical aspects were really on point and I totally agree with you on many aspects, but you know, that you just highlighted, uh, there's a lot of pol- political commentary in the films these days, but it looks interesting. Um, it'll be yeah, cool to see. Absolutely. It'll be cool to see how this film ends. It's, it's a different topic, even though there's like a political commentary aspect here. I hope like whatever they did to like execute it, they did it well and uh, they made a good engaging film. Both Demi Moore and Margaret, they're both looking pot. I'm down. Yeah, so, I think it's going to be a fun movie for sure. Yeah. So the next trailer is uh, Ryan Coogler's Sinners. The trailer actually released after I sent you this article, uh, uh. which I just got to watch like literally five minutes before this conversation. And um, it looks fantastic. But before I say whatever I have to say, uh, do you have anything to share on this part? Um, it ju- it looks intriguing. Like from the article uh, I got, it wasn't, uh, there's not a lot of detail. Uh, Michael B. Jordan's always great. So I, I look forward to uh, seeing it just for that reason in, in some cases. But uh, but uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll I I definitely want to check out the trailer after we're done here and see uh see if there's there's a uh, more appeal than what was written in this in this short blurb on uh, on bloody disgusting. Right. So since then, uh, I've seen the trailer, and I think like from the looks of it, there was a motion poster that was out as well. I think it's an homage to like the classic black exploitation films of the seventies. I don't know if you have, are you familiar with the black exploitation genre. Um, vaguely, not not extensively. So it mostly like had African themes and um, sure. n- I won't say it's something like the kind of cinema we're seeing now, which represents the a- African-American diaspora, like Get Out. But but this is just like, well, for example, there was a there was a movie called Blackula, which is like there was an African Dracula, pretty much that sure. uh, as, as the title suggests. So it was an interesting take on, you know, different kind of popular ips like dracula and frankenstein there was actually a film called blankenstein as well i mean these are fun films to watch and a lot of the black exploitation cinema dealt with voodoo and witchcraft this film i think it pays kind of an homage to ganja and hess which Mm -hmm. is also a classic black exploitation vampire film well, that's really great context you brought because that like just seeing just knowing what I know, which was nothing uh, vampire movie, Michael B. Jordan. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, maybe maybe that'll be interesting. What you're telling me about the the kind of history and kind of the the um, maybe homage it, it homages it pays. Yeah. I think uh, that's really cool that that actually adds a lot more uh, intrigue and interest to me uh, to the movie. Definitely. Basically, like a lot of the black exploitation cinema is like really spiritual. It's really atmospheric, and it's like I think. I mean, if you want to start your journey into like that kind of filmmaking, I would suggest you start with Blackula. But coming back to um, Ganja and Hess, it's basically Dwayne Jones, and he's a vampire who's living like these split lives where you know he's like he's got a multiple personality disorder kind of thing where a part of him thinks he's a vampire because he's addicted to like drinking blood. And uh, part of him thinks he's a human being. That's basically the premise of the film, but it didn't really do well back in the day, but slowly just gained such a cult following that it's been an inspiration for so many horror filmmakers ever since. And um, from the looks of it, this film is pretty much like a modern black exploitation vampire film. It looks like Michael B. Jordan is playing like a double role in it. So I'm intrigued to see they didn't really, they didn't really reveal anything about the plot. Or they didn't even show actual vampires in the trailer, but it's mm-hmm. interesting. I think this is going to be like a game changer. I mean, I'm just saying this right now, especially since it's Ryan Coogler involved and everything that they've done is like, I'm such a huge fan. And, um, and Absolutely. This looks, Michael this B. Jordan so makes good choices. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying this looks so distinctive. That's all. This- I look forward to checking it out. 
but yeah, that was uh, Sinners. And this was a surprise because I was not expecting, I, I did not know anything about this film. So what did you think of the trailer for In a Violent Nature? You know, it showed very little, so that could go either way. Um, <laughs> you know, there was definitely some great moments. I I, I did enjoy the, uh, obviously, the uh, uh, suspense they were building by by showing the killer walking, basically. I mean, yeah, presumed killer, anyways, walking mm-hmm. through the uh, the woods a lot. Um, you know, some of the dialogue, uh, it sounded like it could be cheesy. It, it might not be. It, it just depends on, on where it is, falls in the movie and, you know, how it works out. Um, I'm a little worried that it might, I think my biggest concern with a movie like this is, is it unique enough? Cause I think this movie has been made many times from, you know, eighties and nineties to, you know, modern reinterpretations of the, of the slasher killer type attitude that I'm. I'm they haven't revealed anything that shows like, oh, you know, this is going to be really different or really um, unique from the from previous type entries. So that's my question. That's my open question on this one, because it looks good. The The visuals look um, compelling. Uh, and it's just a matter of if it delivers on being an experience that's not uh, something we've seen before. I was going to pretty much bring up the same thing, the same aspects that you highlighted. It's getting a lot of attention and it's just, it's a Shudder original. Sure. Are you familiar with Shudder? I am. I have definitely heard of them. I'm not sure I could pull out like movies they've, uh, they've been a part of, but no, I'm, I am familiar. So they're basically like a streaming service, like a streaming, like a Netflix or horror film pretty much. And, sure. um, and it's cool to see they're coming out with something. Um, of course, um, my concern is the same as yours, where it looks like a repetition of a lot of the things that's been done before. We'll wait and watch. Yeah, for sure. For sure. To our next topic, the trailer for Timbod. Well, I, despite being a uh, half Indian, I actually haven't watched uh, so many Indian films. I've definitely watched a little more uh, in my youth, you know, being mm-hmm. dragged to uh, like Pardes was a big one um, mm-hmm. in the Indian community. Um, but I did see, uh, and it's not quite relevant to this trailer, but I did see RRR recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not a big music or singing fan. So um, I thought RRR had a good balance um, so I'm my, the the reason I bring that up at all is I'm interested in this. Uh, I'm not a huge um, uh, religious mythology uh, enjoyer, so I'm I'm not sure if I would gravitate toward uh toward uh Tumbad, but I do think uh it does look very interesting. The trailer was very compelling uh, in the way it was put together, so I do have um some interesting thoughts to, and, and some, some ideation to, to check it out because it does look like it could be, um, pretty interesting. Um, and you know, if it, if there are, you know, music, uh, if, if there is music in the movie, I would hope it's uh, a little more well integrated. And the only reason I bring it up is, is like, I, I'm such a, I, I just remember the, the like kind of classic Bollywood trope of you have like the couple running through the, or, or couple or people dating running through the like fruit trees and then 15 of their gendered friends show up and dance on. <laughs> and it's just like, it's, it's not natural. Like I'm a, I'm a very like, this is not natural to how people relate and talk and live life. Um, so that that's always been my, my hesitance toward anything with, with music or singing. Uh, mm-hmm. But like I say, there. I, now that I've seen RRR, I am aware of of uh, other Indian films that can kind of integrate the the singing element into a more narrative uh, aspect, or at least in a better way. This film is okay. nothing like your typical Bollywood film, and it's not even a Bollywood film. It's like a proper Indian film, which is independently produced and made. This doesn't have anything like your typical song and dance or, you know, what you've seen before. This film, it's about greed. The way this aspect is addressed by incorporating culture, by incorporating mythology, by incorporating phenomenal acting, phenomenal camera work. And the more you look into this film's history and how how it was made, it was literally like a 12-year journey for the director to get this film made. It was shot the way it is the makers didn't like the first cut of it. So they reshot pretty much the whole thing. And when they released it, it didn't really get good reviews. 
but now they re-released it. And the kind of response it's been getting is like, people really haven't seen this kind of film, let, let alone Indians seeing something like this. Even Western audiences, I feel, are so in awe of what they've accomplished. It's the kind of film that'll give you nightmares. But at the same time, the message of the film, the core of the film is like the message that it delivers and the way it delivers it. It's just so raw. It's just so perfect. Okay, yeah, that's that's quite a quite an endorsement. Yeah, I will definitely put it at the top of my watch list and, and make that a priority because that, uh, that's amazing. That sounds great. So for our last topic, Raj's film, The Seductress from Hell. I would love to know a bit more about it. For sure. Well, The Seductress from Hell is about a young woman, an actress, who is pushed beyond her breaking point uh, due to her psychopathic, abusive husband and the um, uh, unreasonable demands of uh, Hollywood and capitalism in some ways. So that's that's kind of the main, um, uh, you know, theme of the story, the main idea of the of the tale we're we're telling. Um, written by, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Andrew Deberg, who also directed it as well. And yeah, it it's you know something I really enjoyed. Um, seeing come together and enjoy now, you know, as it's gotten some press and some critic reviews, it's been really fun to see, um, what people think. And, and we're about to go to the, uh, Glendale, uh, international film festival, um, this, this weekend, um, which, which this episode probably won't make it out for, but next month, uh, perhaps, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Michaud film festival. We also have. So if anyone is, uh, is there in the LA area, you know, please come out. That sounds fantastic. Congratulations for the uh, festivals. And uh, I've seen the trailer. It looks phenomenal. And uh, best of luck for the film. And um, I'd like to know what inspired you to get involved in a project like this. I think when when Andrew presented me the script, and Andrew and I had met at a, at a social gathering, uh, like a meetup type thing, um, and we realized we were kind of, you know, on the same page on a, on a political level, um, at the very least. So we, we kind of bonded over that. Um, and I said, as I said, he shot the, uh, commercial for Indie Sweets and Spices. Um, so ever since, uh, we've been looking for, uh, you know, a project to do together. So, um, you know, this was, this was it. Um, and it, it really came together, it came together well. And what appealed to you most about the story in contrast to the other scripts that you, I'm sure you keep on reading different scripts. For sure. What I like, I guess that's why I brought up the political stuff in general is, you know, I, I enjoy the kind of social commentary or, or even political commentary that movies uh, have for me, you know, the kind of catharsis to feel that there's an understanding um, of, of ideas that maybe feel like they're, Mostly, you know, unseen, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, aspects of our lives that are built upon other aspects that we, you know, it, it's, it's part of the keeping the system going is making sure we don't see those things is what I'm, what I'm trying to get at. And I'm drawn to stories that do the opposite of that, that really highlight and bring attention to kind of the things we're, we're not thinking about, you know, as we, you know, buy a Starbucks latte or, or whatever the case may be, you know, I don't don't pick on Starbucks just on purpose. It's just like, it's just a good example of, of this thing as as we kind of live our lives in this uh, consumptive way. uh, We kind of miss a lot of the, um, the things holding it all up. And I think that that's, what's really important to me and what drew me to this script in particular, um, and, and ideally, you know, more scripts like it as I continue in this producing world. Yes. And that's, I was actually going to come to that. What inspired you to get into the producing side of the film business? Well, I mean, there's a couple, there's a couple of hats. There's a couple of ways to answer that. Like as an executive producer, I would say to make money. I mean, like there's certainly other, or maybe even better ways to make money, but, uh, I do think there is a uh, synergy between the putting an investment towards something that's, 
I don't know, really tangible in, in the, in the idea that you can see it come together. You can, you know, uh, talk to the crew, you can, you know, uh, you can watch the movie after it's finished. You can cut trailers. You can, it's, it's a, you know, it's an investment in a way that's really like in your face. Uh, I mean, depending on your involvement, of course, but, uh, it can really be something that you can hold and have. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's art, you know, I enjoy art for art's sake, even if we do have to, um, mix the two in the world we have, you know, art simply has to exist in the business world because of the, the kind of social, political, uh, economic order we have. Um, and I think that's one strong appealing factor of producing in general is it's a, cool way to mix those two of like spending money on a product that's really um an art form as well um i think the other side of it is as an actor as an actor you're constantly um you know at the behest of gatekeepers to you know get you hired, you know, casting director likes you. Oh, you made it through the first step, but the producer doesn't like you. So you're not hired. You know, there's so many different, um, people that can say no, that you're waiting a lot. You're, you're auditioning, you're giving it your all and you're constantly just like rejected or, or more likely you don't hear at all. Um, right, right, and that's, right. that could be, that, that could be really, uh, painful and really demoralizing. So yeah. I think the, the producer, the uh, producing as as an actor side is is simply just like I want to work, you know. If even if that means, um, you know, paying, you know, essentially or or buying my way into a role, which is not the way I want to think about it. I'd like to think that I would still, even if I was like funding a project, if I didn't think I was good for a role, I'd be like, nah, let's not use me because I'm not going to make my money back. I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I think it's that. It's like let me, let me produce so I can act, you know, I can actually do what I want to be doing. Um, and hopefully, you know, through the whole like perception or through the whole idea of like, you know, kind of dressing for the job you have, you know, if you're acting a lot, even if you're producing the thing, maybe someone will be like, oh, he's acting, you know, maybe we'll get him on our thing. You know, that's the hope. That's always been the hope. It's kind of was the hope on my streaming things as well. You know, you hook up with indie developers and you're like, oh, I hope they'll promote me. I'll promote them. And, and sadly, you know, some of them saw the vision for that and a lot of them didn't, you know, you're not, uh, you're not Ninja, you're not Pokimane, you're not, you know, some big streamer. So they kind of don't see the value in the small streamer as much. That's at least my perception. I could be wrong about that, but my perception is, uh, yeah, sometimes you got to build, build the vision of what you see yourself as, and maybe more people will start hiring you for that too. That's really inspiring. Um, it's really, it's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. So how can we as an audience support the seductress from hell? Well, I mentioned the the Michaud Film Festival or, or, or Glendale, if you do happen to hear this before uh, Saturday, but I, I think that's unlikely. But um, yeah, Michaud Film Festival in October. Um, and then I expect it'll be, uh, you know, not right away, but it'll eventually be on VOD. It might have some uh, theatrical like uh, releases, you know, in, in uh, local theaters, which we're also uh, toying around with the idea of. So, uh, yeah, I just keep in keep in touch. You know, uh, I, I don't know the exact Instagram handle, but we are on Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter um, and, you know, as am I. Uh, so yeah, I think the best way is to just keep in touch on those, on those social media and, and, you know, follow us where we go. And that's amazing. I mean, if you've got some useful links to the film, I would definitely include them in the description below. But yeah. Thank you so much for being a part of this podcast and, uh, we'll talk next week. 